Good day. I'm Commander uh, Patrick Mantle of the Huntington Militia, and welcome to the Huntington Arsenal uh, here in the, uh, the town of Huntington. Uh, now, today we were supposed to have our uh, Militia Muster Day, uh, which we hold every May uh, around, the, around this time. All right, I'm being told that we don't have audio right now. Give me one second. We've been having a couple of technical difficulties. All right, sorry, sorry about that. So anyway, we've been, we usually have our muster day here in the, uh, the beginning of, of, of May. Uh, now because of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and social distancing orders, we had to uh, cancel the, uh, the event and we have postponed all our uh, future and upcoming events, but we still wanted to bring you some Long Island history uh, in, in this time. Uh, so, as again, again we're right now we're in the Huntington Arsenal, which was the home of Job Samus uh, in 1775. He was a weaver. Uh, so, I'm going to give you a little background history on, on the Huntington Militia. Uh, the Huntington Militia was established in the year 1653. It was originally uh, it, uh, established the same year as the town of Huntington it, itself. Uh, this was actually during a time when uh, what we call New York today was actually still uh, New Netherlands and the southern tip of Manhattan was New Amsterdam. Uh, and, but so the settlement was primarily English settlers, and so they wanted a militia to defend themselves against the somewhat hostile Dutch uh, settlements uh, to the west and the uh, Native Americans that were still in the, uh, in the area. Uh, so the militia was a, uh, a civic obligation. Every able-bodied man between the ages of 16 and 60 had to serve in the militia for home defense. And so these were just normal civilians. They had their uh, own day jobs. Uh, they were not professional soldiers. So what they would do is they would have militia musters, uh, which would be either on a seasonal basis, annual basis, or for the Huntington Militia, a, uh, a, a monthly basis. They would come out to the town green, to the town common, to uh, muster or drill and, and practice the manual of arms, how to load and fire their muskets, how to march uh, in time, and stuff like that. Uh, so the Huntington Militia, uh, being established in 1653, uh, actually also did serve in the French and Indian Wars before the Revolutionary War, uh, alongside British soldiers on multiple expeditions to Canada. Now fast forward now to the Revolutionary War, uh, in actually 17, actually before the Revolutionary War, in 1774, uh, you can see that uh, Huntington had a lot of patriotic fervor, uh, and they sympathized with what was going on in Boston at, at the time. And in 1774, the, uh, the town of Huntington uh, established and, and drafted the uh, Huntington Declaration of Rights. And in, the, in this document, they actually sympathized with Boston and, uh, and declared things like that personal property could not be taken away. So you can definitely see that, the, that Huntington was sympathetic to the quote unquote patriot cause. Now in 1775, things get a little bit more hectic. In April of 1775, April uh, 19th uh, to be exact, if you cracked open a, a history textbook uh, recently, you know that that was the battles of Lexington and Concord. Uh, so it was the first time that uh, colonial, American colonial militias faced off against British regulars. The news of those battles uh, reached Long Island a few weeks later. Uh, and then on May 2nd, 1775, so basically 245 years and one day ago, uh, the, the town of Huntington uh, drafted a, a new Huntington militia, which would be a, a company of 80 men, uh, quote, chosen to exercise and ready to march. Now, what did this mean? This basically meant that this was a Minuteman company. So if you you heard Minuteman, they were the militia, uh, American militia, that were supposed to be ready at a moment's notice or a minute's notice uh, to respond to an emergency, to respond to uh, impending enemy, to defend uh, the town, the community. Uh, so that's what this, uh, this was. Uh, and so we believe that actually Job Samus, whose house we're sitting in, uh, standing in here now, uh, his uh, son Nathaniel, who was uh, 18 at the time here in 1775, was probably a member of that uh, militia company. Uh, so uh, 
there was a lot of excitement, but also uh, some fear going going on. So the town of Huntington definitely wanted to be prepared because right outside Boston in Lexington and Concord, uh, militias very, very similar to the Huntington militia squared off against British regulars. So they thought if it could happen up there, they could come, but would stop British soldiers from coming here and doing the same thing. So this started now a huge push for the town of Huntington and the Huntington militia to gather arms and equipment to pre basically to prepare for war. So the first thing I actually want to do, uh, just so I'm not just talking the entire time, is actually see how long would a Minuteman in Huntington take to, uh, to, to, get, to get ready. So we're going to come right over here and this way. Now before we go, I'm going to get my, uh, no, stay over there. Okay, I am. I've got to get my, uh, my technical crew who are my parents who are helping me out today. while we are practicing social distancing. All right, so as I'll talk about in, the, in a little bit, uh, Job Samus was actually a, a weaver. And you can see over here, here is his, his loom. Um, and so we'll talk about that in just, in just a little bit. And everyone in the household, including Nathaniel probably, who is his son, his oldest son, would be helping with, with the business. Now, the Minuteman probably, we were supposed to have all their arms and, and equipment ready to go at a moment's notice, always have it on them. But if I'm over here helping my dad, I'm probably not gonna be wearing all, all my, uh, my accoutrements. So, if I'm over here and then it's, and I start hearing the, the church bells ringing in, it's not Sunday, the church bells would have been used as the alarm uh, for the militia to get, make sure that to let everyone know that uh, it, the alarm is being sounded and that the militia should muster on the, uh, on the, the town common. So, Mom, when uh, you're ready, you, you tell me when, when to go. Okay. Okay, so the bells are ringing. It's not Sunday, so the alarm is being sound. I need to get my accoutrements on first, close on the cartridge box, because that means that no matter what I take off of me, the cartridge box still stays on. Got my powder horn, just in case I run out of paper cartridges. I've got my secondary weapons, my uh, sword and bayonet. Got my canteen, because I need to stay hydrated. I'm gonna switch out my workman's cap to a cocked hat and have my knapsack here. My knapsack will kit carry some extra items now that I'm snacked up. Extra clothing and, and, and such like that. And I'll probably have a tomahawk in, in there as well. And then lastly, I got my blanket roll, which has my market wallet inside, which has my rations for three days, as, long as, I, as well as my cup and a plate and some utensils. And lastly, my musket, and stop. And I am ready to go. And you can see, it took me about a minute and three seconds. So pretty much close, close to a minute. And now I am ready to head out and, uh, and, and muster on the green to be ready to march. Now again, we'll go through the, the equipment that I have, that I have on. First, the cartridge box. This cartridge box is made out of leather and has a wood block in, in, the, bo in the bottom of it here. Uh, so uh, this is where you hold your paper cartridges. I have an example of one here. This would have enough powder for uh, one shot and the musket ball would be at the bottom. The powder horn would hold loose powder and also what I would also have on my, my person as well would be a, uh, a shot bag, which would be a leather pouch. I actually have that in my, my knapsack on my back, and that's where I would keep loose uh, balls, uh, musket balls as, as well. Now that stays on my, my right side. On my left side, I've got my secondary weapons. In the militia, especially in the, the colony of New York, you had to have a secondary weapon to your firelock, to your, to your musket. Uh, and the most common one before 1775 was a sword. Uh, this is an example of a hanger, which would be very common for uh, officers. 
uh, but also hunting swords would have been used or long knives, stuff like that, uh, or a tomahawk. Um, that would be very common, but then after 1775, the bayonet was the most common uh, secondary weapon. But they were very, very expensive because they had to be fitted to the musket uh, that, you, that you had. And all the muskets were all handmade. We, this is before they have interchangeable parts and uh, large factories produced weapons. Uh, so all the muskets were slightly different. And also the bayonet is a military uh, tool. So it has to be fitted to a military musket, a military uh, weapon. Uh, so many militias, especially all, all over the, uh, the, the colonies, they did not have military uh, firearms, so they couldn't have military bayonets. Uh, the Huntington militia, though, because uh, Huntington was actually a very wealthy uh, community at, that, at this time, being a very diverse uh, economy with both uh, merchants and, and agricultural and lots of crafts and uh, different trades, uh, were able to out, eventually outfit their militia with uh, military muskets like the brown vests that I have right here uh, and, and bayonets. And so they would train uh, with these muskets and bayonets on the, on the village green. So now let's fast forward now. So this is the, the Minuteman Company. It's been ready to march. It didn't have to do anything. Things change again in September of 1775 when the entire old militia system was completely thrown out the window and then a new militia system was, was created so that they, uh, uh, that would just be, uh, uh, what was it, uh, taking orders from the committee, uh, committee of safety. Prior to that, they would actually be taking uh, orders from the uh, provincial government, from uh, the provincial governor. Uh, so now that's out the window. Now the Huntington militia is taking orders from uh, the committee of safety. Now these companies actually, uh, there would actually be multiple that would be, uh, uh, be uh, that would come together, would actually become part of the first uh, first regiment of Suffolk County militia. Uh, so we know that there are these uh, multiple companies were being uh, being formed, uh, especially here in, in Huntington. And at this time, uh, Job Samus uh, said to the militia, "Hey, listen, my house is right next to the village green." You can use my house, and in particular, the attic, to hold arms and ammunition. And so that's what the militia did, and that's why this house is now known as the Huntington Arsenal. Don't know, really know if it was actually known of that at the time, but eventually it's been given uh, that name. But really, only the, this house was, was an arsenal between September of 1775 and uh, August of 1776. So really less than a year, uh, but it still hold, holds that name. So in September of 1775, the uh, uh, New York uh, provincial government, um, that, well, the provincial Congress, sorry, not the government, the, the provincial Congress uh, sent the Huntington militia 100 uh, kegs of gunpowder, 100 pounds of gunpowder, sorry. Uh, and then in uh, January of 1776, there was another order, another order uh, a shipment of gunpowder came, and that was a hundred, a hundred, a thousand pounds, sorry, a thousand pounds of, of gunpowder. And so that would be up sitting right, uh, right above us where, where we are, uh, as well as uh, buskets, bayonets, cartridge boxes, canteens, uh, every, uh, drums, tents, uh, all these things were, were collected uh, to prepare uh, Huntington for, uh, for battle. So eventually, the Huntington Militia would see battle in August of 1776 uh, at the Battle of uh, Brooklyn, or also called the Battle of Long Island. Uh, so they, uh, when the British la uh, landed uh, in New York, first starting in, uh, at Staten Island, uh, the alarm came out to uh, Long Island and to, uh, to Huntington uh, that we had to uh, prepare for, for battle and, and, and send troops. Um, to aid the uh, Continental Army that was uh, based in New York. So the first couple of Minuteman companies showed up here on the Huntington Green and they marched off to, uh, to help with the battle, but the ma majority of the Huntington militia actually stayed behind to defend the town of Huntington because there were actually reports that the British were sending troops to Huntington Bay to, to invade the town. So they wanted to keep the main body of the militia here to defend the town of Huntington, just in case British regulars marched through the town. Actually, unfortunately, 
those reports were a deceptive move by the British. They wanted the Long Island militias, the local militias in the, air, in the area, to stay home and stay in their localities and not go towards New York City. So it, and it ended up working, a lot of the Long Island militias stayed home or stayed uh, at their, in, in their towns and the communities. It did not aid General Washington uh, in the Battle of Brooklyn. Now, also if you crack the history textbook, you, you know that Battle of Brooklyn was a huge defeat for Washington and the Continental Army, the American Army. Um, and the American Army would then flee uh, to, uh, through, through Manhattan, through uh, Harlem, White Plains, and then into New Jersey. And a few Huntington militia members would, have, would join them, but the majority would come back uh, to Huntington, to their families. Uh, and if they, if they were, if they were smart, I think, they, a lot of them went to uh, cross over Long Island Sound to Connecticut, which was still uh, occupied by, uh, by Patriot forces, by American, uh, American forces, because then on September 1st, 1776, the British entered Huntington, and Huntington remained occupied by the British until the end of the war in 1783. Now, that's a story for a, for a different day. So right now, we're going to take you guys outside and show just what it's like to load and fire a musket. So let's go. As I mentioned before, this is an example of a brown vest musket. Uh, actually, it wasn't called a brown vest in the uh, in the 18th century. Uh, it was actually called the second model shortland pattern musket. And what that meant was it's the second model of, of this particular musket, the point block musket. And shortland means it's actually shorter than its actual earlier brother, which actually was four inches longer. It was a flint lock musket, so you can see it's operating by a piece of flint right here, just a stone, striking against this steel hammer, or what we call the, or, or sometimes called the steel. And you know that when flint hits steel, you get sparks. So that's how this musket is actually fired. Put a little bit of gunpowder right here in the pan right there, and then the rest of the powder and the musket ball go through the barrel, down the muzzle. It's a muzzle-loading weapon. So not like a modern weapon that you're loading through the breech or a breech loader. This is a muzzle loader. So you have to be standing up to load and fire this uh, this weapon. Powder and the ball go down down the barrel. You have to ram it down with the ram run, and then you'll be ready ready to fire. Now I wouldn't be doing this all by myself. I would actually have Ben ne next to me uh, in, in line. Both the Americans and, and the British did fight in formations. Uh, now, sometimes that can be a little uh, tricky and de deceiving. Sometimes they, they fought in very regimented, linear tactics, but most of the time, especially in the Revolutionary War, uh, tactics and, and, and maneuvering on the battlefield was much more fluid. Uh, so sometimes you would have soldiers not shoulder to shoulder, but spaced out maybe an arm's length, uh, so, uh, so to speak. Uh, but you always want to stay in the formation because you always want to fire all together like a giant shotgun to rain lead down upon the enemy. That's because these weapons are fairly inaccurate because they are smooth bore weapons. They're not like a modern rifle that have a spiral cut group called rifling down the barrel. This is just a hollow tube like a shotgun. And the musket ball is actually smaller the diameter of the barrel. This is a 75 caliber weapon, so you're going to be using probably between a 69 and a 70, uh, 71 or 73 caliber ball. What does that mean? What does caliber mean? That's the diameter of the, of the barrel. 75, ca 75 caliber means that this is three quarters of an inch in diameter. Very, very big. And the musket ball is very, very big. It's like a huge marble, and, but it's all round, not conical. It's just like a big spear. So since it's smooth, it's a smooth bore, and the musket ball is smaller than the diameter of the barrel, the musket ball literally bounces down and out of the barrel. So the last place that the musket ball hits, that's the direction it's, it's going. So at a, a long, long distance, this is very, very inaccurate. 
So what they would actually do in, in the ancient country, when they would line up and start getting into battle, when they would see the enemy at a far distance, they would actually lob their rust bolts in the air, almost like, like archers would do uh, in the medieval times with, with arrows. And then as you start getting closer, you would probably level down your, your musket. But once you're within a hundred yards or so of uh, of the uh, of the enemy, which is probably the most the best distance to be firing this at anyway, if you're actually aiming at a target, is about a, about a hundred yards. Anything further than that, you really can't hit any anything. But when you're within that distance, you're probably going to be doing a bayonet charge. Which we'll be talking about it in a little bit. So we'd all be up at the shoulder, marching into battle. And the first command we'll be given would be to prime and load. So first I would open up the hammer, exposing the pan, sign my cartridge box to take out my paper cartridge. Then, to be a musket man, the, uh, the, the uh, legend goes you have to have two opposing teeth to rip the paper cartridge. Now the rest would be poured, the, some of the powder would be poured down the, uh, the pan just like that. So you can see some of the, pan, the uh, powder right there in the pan. Then I would close. The, uh, the hammer there, and that protects the powder so they can cast the musket about like this. Pour the rest of the powder down the barrel. In this point, the musket ball would also be right here. This does not have a musket ball, this is just a blank. But the paper and the musket ball go down together because the paper acts as the wadding to make sure that the musket ball does not uh, roll down the end of the barrel. So as I said, the musket ball is smaller than the barrel. I have to ram it down with the ram rod because if I don't, and the musket ball is anywhere in the barrel and not seated against the powder, this becomes a pipe bomb when you fire it and it'll explode in your face because of that pressure. You also have to replace the ramrod because if you don't, then you can't fire your next shot. And if you leave it in the barrel and fire it at the enemy, it might create a nice harpoon, but you won't be able to reload. Very, very important to keep your, your, your ramrod uh, with you. Now the musket is loaded, we go back up to the shoulder. This lets the commanders know that we are all ready to fire, okay? And the next uh, command would be to make ready. We bring our muscles up, just like this, and we thumb the, the uh, half, the uh, cock, which would be called the cock of the lock, with the, uh, the first the, the flint, the full cock. Not just with the hammer full. Now we're ready to, to fire. The next command would be present. In 1775, we're getting the order to pre present, not take aim. And then finally, to fire. Fire! And then the whole process would continue over again. A good musket man can get off uh, three aim shots uh, in a minute. And they usually did not keep up to that, um, even though they, they wanted to uh, keep their uh, keep up a high rate of fire. That was the main point of having uh, these weapons. Is you can keep a high rate of fire uh, very, very quickly uh, to basically rain down lead on, on the enemy, soften them up, and, and try to get them to uh, quit the field. That's the main point in the 18th century. You don't want to kill enemies on your, the enemy on the other side. That's not the point of warfare in the 18th century. You want them to quit the field or surrender or give up, retreat, because holding the field or taking the field, taking the battlefield was how you won in the 18th century. You could lose half your men, but if you held the field at the end of the day, you still won the battle. And that's how warfare was fought in the 18th century. Now, if you saw when I fired the musket, a lot of white smoke came out of this. These are black powder weapons, so they produce a lot of white smoke. Now, think of all these uh, muskets going off, these cannons going off, all firing this, this black powder with all this white smoke. After many, many volleys, you can't see your hand in front of your face. So, uh, what would be very, would be very impressive to, to, to see, probably very, very scary to see, would be a whole line of soldiers now going to fix bayonets. Pick two of them, it. Shoulder your arms. Charge your bayonet. it. Huzzay! Now imagine that, a whole line of soldiers with these fixed bayonets making up muskets basically into huge pipes. Screaming and charging across, across the battlefield just like this. You want to have been some amazing sight to see. Talk about the bayonet for a second. This is what's called a socket bayonet. Uh, it's supposed to fit on the muzzle of the musket like a socket. Uh, it's got three sides on it. It's a three-side bayonet. Very, very gruesome. You do not want to get stuck with this because if you get stuck with this, you're going down 
and 100% you are going to die. You get shot with a musket, with a musket ball, you might live, but this was the most feared weapon on the 18th century battlefield. You did not want to face off against this. So in the early part of the Revolutionary War, back to we were in 1775, the Huntington militia allowed them to have bayonets, but a lot of other militias in the American colonies do not have these bayonets. As I mentioned before, because they're using civilian weapons, um, civilian fowlers and, uh, and fire lots of, in that sense, that don't fit bayonets. And so if you have a, your enemy charging with bayonets, there is no way you can repel that charge unless you have a bayonet. So when, when this happened, when the British would charge with their glistening bayonets, with their nice scarlet uh, red uniforms, and uh, the Grenadiers with this big bearskin uh, cap, they can look eight feet tall, you can understand why a lot of American militiamen uh, ran away and quit the, quit the field at that point. And that's actually what happened a lot during the Battle of Brooklyn. Now I'm going to take, let's just take a little break. Let's go actually go see if there's any questions that uh, is from the audience. So let's go back inside. Do you have any questions? No, but a lot of comments. Yeah. It's great. Okay. It's very noisy outside. It's much better in, in here. So I'm going to take off my military equipment right here, and we'll uh, talk more about the house. While I'm taking all this off, I do want to mention um, that, especially since we are in this unprecedented uh, an uncertain time. I hope everyone is staying safe and maintaining social distancing. And I definitely want to thank healthcare workers and the essential workers, um, especially, especially. Oh, this one with the video. Okay. Spe okay. Especially, especially teachers. And I'm a little biased myself. I definitely want to also think because I don't think they get um, enough recognition. Uh, newscasters, journalists who are who are telling these stories and um, and keeping the public informed about what's going on with uh, this pandemic. So definitely want everyone to stay safe, uh, stay healthy. So uh, make sure if you're outside, wear a mask. So let's go and take a little stroll around in the house. I'm just gonna get my. You can sit right there. I'm gonna just get my cheat sheet here. So this plot of land that, we ha that we're on right, right now uh, was acquired in 1653, uh, and uh, it was originally bought by a man named William Rogers. Now, he didn't do anything with the land. Uh, the first time there was actually a building here was in 1740, uh, when uh, jo uh, Joseph w uh, Wicks uh, built a storage building uh, here. And that's basically this part of the building here. Okay. Everything here from the, the door onward. Now, if you pan the, the camera over a little bit here, and you can see these slots here, or you can pan up and see these slots over here too, with these holes. You can see that this is where the original end of the house used to be. Now, you, so you can see how construction was done in the 18th century. So, to build a wall here, you have these cutouts in the beam. You put a stud through here, and then you put wooden pegs through these holes. And you tap that in, and that holds the beam up, and then you build the wall upon that. So this was a very, very small building. Did not have a fireplace, so it was not a house. It was not a livable dwelling. It was only a building to hold grain. It wasn't until uh, 1748 where uh, the new owner of the building, uh, Gershom Sexton, uh, added the fireplace that we see behind us 
here and added and ended the wall to here. So now they made it into a uh, a livable dwelling. Let me also mention that both the, the suit, it was with a second floor. You can actually see the cutout right here. This is where the ladder was, or the, the staircase. It was more like a ladder, not, like, not much of a staircase, up to the second, second floor. So now with the addition of the fireplace, which is a very interesting fireplace because it's kind of catty-quartered, it's kind of diagonal into the building. Um, so now it's a livable dwelling to have a fireplace. Uh, but also, it, it's very, very uncommon for houses in the 18th century to have just one fireplace. Uh, but this is a very little modest uh, little little home. So now where does Job Sam's uh, come in? Uh, he purchased the house in uh, 1751, uh, basically after Gershom Sexton dies and then the, ha the, the land is sold to, uh, to Job. Um, so and then he takes it over and then he extends the house through here. This is what's called the north chamber. And then also this way to create a, uh, a room called the buttery uh, and a bed chamber. Again, still having the, uh, the second floor running throughout the, uh, the entire house. So he extended the building, but still a very, very small, modest home. Uh, the Samuses are, are members of what's called the middling sort, uh, what we call today the working class or the middle class, as opposed to in the 18th century, the poor the, at the lowest end, and the gentry who were like the, the rich and the, and, and the wealthy. So he's, a middle, he's part of the middling sort. So this is a very, very common house uh, for, for that family. Uh, so Job is married to a woman named Elizabeth Cullum, uh, and they, have, they had 10 children, 10 children throughout their, their entire life. Now in 1775, we definitely know that one of the oldest uh, daughters is married and has moved away. And possibly the other two uh, older daughters are married, but we don't have uh, marriage records for those two. Uh, the oldest male is Nathaniel, as I mentioned before, who's 18 and a member of the militia. So there's a possibility that there's nine, between nine and 11 people living in this house in 1775. And that's just the family. Because we also do know that Job owned slaves. Um, this is 1775 in New York. There was still slavery here. And we know of at least three slaves uh, that, that uh, worked for uh, the family. But the slaves here in the 18th century, they were educated. They had to know how to read and write because they had to help out with the business. And the reason why actually we know about uh, Job owning slaves is because one of their signatures uh, resides on a deed to purchase more land, uh, to purchase more property. Um, so, where did all these people sleep? So if we come around this way, careful of the legs there. This is the master bed chamber. This is where Job and Elizabeth would, would sleep. Looks like a very small room, but in the 18th century, you're only using your, be your bedroom to sleep and possibly get changed. So that's all you really need room for is so yeah the bed and the bed how it works is that it's actually a uh, rope bed you can see these ropes here so you can actually uh, tighten it if you wanted to and then there's like a sheet of leather so you're not resting upon the the ropes and then there are two mattresses the bottom mattress would usually be filled uh, with straw and then the top mattress would be filled with feathers it's a very very nice mattress very very uh, comfortable in the 18th century though it was uh, very uncommon to sleep lying down. Uh, you would sleep with a slight incline or almost like uh, sitting up. It was thought to have been good for the digestion and good for the respiratory system, especially when you're in a house that has a fire burning constantly, you're staying a little bit above uh, that area of, like, of smoke, if there would be smoke in the house. Usually wouldn't be, but again, you're in a, you're in a uh, house with, a, with fire all the time, so that's how uh, people uh, would sleep in the 18th century. Let's go back into the uh, the main chamber over here. So where where are the children sleeping? Okay, that's where that's where Job and Elizabeth sleep. Well, some would sleep here. This is called the Shaw bed. Okay, very very similar to the to bed in the bed chamber. It's a rope bed, but this would actually come down 
right here, but you can push it back up so to get to get it out of the way. This type of bed, it's a real nice, real nice bed. Could fit three small children or two uh, older children. Where the rest sleeping? Well, it's possibly that they're sleeping on pallets on the floor. Now, what's why you mean that by, by that? It's the, those two mattresses I mentioned before, the straw mattress and feather mattress, um, but probably propped up against the wall so you can have your bolster, which was what, what uh, we call today a pillow, your bolster up against the wall so you can be prop, propped up. So you can put out a couple of uh, uh, pallets here or possibly they were uh, sleeping upstairs. Uh, let's go back to the, uh, the fireplace over here for a second. So the fireplace, this was, this was basically Elizabeth uh, Colum Samus' uh, uh, area. So this was where she would either uh, uh, be cooking or overseeing the cooking, because she might have delegated it out uh, uh, to, uh, to the slaves in order to do that. So um, unlike what you see in the movies and stuff like that, you would not cook on a blazing hot fire. What you do is you would build your fire here in the fireplace, and then print, burn down the wood to hot, red hot coals. And you would bring those out with a shovel, right here, and you would bring that out onto the, uh, the bricks over here and cook upon that. You would use something like this, this is called a trivet. Then you can put a pan, pot or a pan onto, onto that, and that's basically like your stovetop burner that we have today. But in order to regulate the heat, is how many coals you put on or how many you take away stuff like that. So that's how uh, you would cook here uh, in, in the house. Now if we come back into the buttery over here, this would be the preparation room for, uh, for, for the cooking. So here we have buckets of water that the children would, 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 uh, would get. They would come out and go get you know, water. We have different types of pots and, and pans right here. Um, two very interesting things. This pot, if you look at that, we would probably call that a Dutch oven today. It wasn't called a Dutch oven in, in the 18th century. This was called a bake kettle. And this was your oven. This was your oven in the 18th century when you, if you didn't have an earthen oven uh, in, in your home, which was a, a different thing. So you see you have a pot with an indented lid. So this way you could put it onto the coals and put coals on top. So this basically preheats this pot. So you can bake bread in it, you can bake stews in it, uh, anything that you want, want really uh, in that. In the 18th century, this thing down here was actually called a Dutch oven. In the 19th century, it's called a reflective oven. Today, we might call it a rotisserie. So you put like whatever you want, chicken or, or whatnot in there, and you have a crank on the side that will rotate it. And on the inside, since it's all metal, it disperses the heat around, and that's how it, it cooks. So in this room, we would have everything that uh, Elizabeth would need uh, to prepare uh, the meals for the, for the day. We have all uh, plates and, uh, and silverware over, over here, um, and then all the things for, for cooking, and some other, other items uh, as well. We got uh, sugar, which was very, very important. They came in these cones. And you use like little snaps in order to get the, the, the sugar off. This right here is a uh, a pot scrubber. So when you have to afterwards, when you're cleaning up, you scrub, use that to uh, scrub uh, the pots. You would bake uh, bread in here. This is a, uh, a a dish for making uh, dough for bread with a rolling pin. Um, what else is over here? And then these would be your uh, your washing machine to get this all nice and soapy and up. And you would use this to uh, to scrub your uh, your clothes at the end end of the day. And you might use a, a bucket such as this to uh, to to do your laundry in. So this is room for for all of that. So now let's go and see and see what Job was doing. Since again, as I said, he's a weaver. So we're going to start over here. So this is the north chamber, uh, which is set up to uh, look like uh, Job's preparation room. Uh, was all this up here? Maybe, maybe not, but it's as much possible that it, it, it was. So Job was, was a weaver, so he makes, makes fabric. In the 8th century, the most common fabrics were wool and linen. Uh, wool comes from the, uh, 
from, from, the, from sheep, and linen comes from the flax plant. So that's a plant that comes, grows out of the ground that many farmers grow, and that can be turned into to linen. So uh, you would definitely see a different, a lot of different uh, spinning wheels uh, and other items like, like that. Um, so this big one right here is called the walking wheel, and this would be used for, uh, for wool. So what you would have, you would get your wool here. This is just some example of just regular wool off a sheep. And then it would collect here, and it would twist and turn into different yarn and thread. Because this is a really interesting thing. So like you see this wool, like it can easily be pulled apart like that. But if I twist it really, really tight, hopefully this works. Now I twist it a little bit and I'm pulling as hard as I can and it's not gonna break. So after it, that's when that's what the spinning wheels do. They twist the wool just like that and they do the same thing with the flax point. This is actually a flax, uh, a linen uh, spinning wheel here. It twists the, uh, it up like this, the material up like this, and then you would soak it. And after it's soaked and dried, it then uh, keeps it, its form. And then you can make uh, yarn. And then you can dye the yarn any color you want using different dyes. Uh, usually there are plants uh, that you would dye them, dye them with, like leaves and stuff like that. Um, the paper that was around the sugar that I showed you before and the buttery, that could be used to make a nice uh, light blue dye. It was very, very good. Um, uh, matter was, called, was uh, common for red. It was a very inexpensive dye. But if you wanted the, night, the best red uh, dye, you use cochineal which was actually little uh, beetles. Um, and it was very, very expensive. Uh, but actually, uh, British officers used uh, uh, wool dyed with cochineal for their, uh, for their coats. And you actually can see the difference between their bright red coats and the matter red coats that the average soldier would, would wear. So that's how you would make the, uh, the yarn. But uh, as I said before, like everyone is involved in this business. It's Job's business as, as a weaver. Uh, so he's putting together uh, different, uh, uh, these different fabrics, wool and, and linen. And so what do the children do? Right behind you is something that the children would do. These two things here, um, they're missing a little thing. They're missing a thing on the side here. It was a flat piece of metal that would go snap or pop after it's been turned a certain amount of time. So this counts how much yarn you have. Uh, so you, the children would wrap up the, the, uh, the yarn on, on it and, and go and go, and then it would go snap, it will go pop, and they know that it's one yard. So they would either mark it, depending on where, where it is, if, it's, if it was here, which it probably wouldn't have been, they would mark it on the staircase or they would mark it on the wall with a piece of chalk, or if they had a little uh, chalkboard on themselves, they'll, they'll mark it. So this way, like while we're, they're spinning, uh, the, the wool or the, uh, the flax, we're getting the yarn. The children are now counting how, much, how, uh, how many yards uh, of thread. And so you go pop, okay, that's one yard pop, that's two yards. So what's this thing called? It's called a weasel. So you know, all the, we all know the song, all around the cobbler's bench, the monkey chased the weasel, the monkey thought it was all in fun, pop goes the weasel. So the children would sing that song while they were uh, uh, collecting the thread. Now let's come back into here. Now we can see where the real weaving is. This is an example of a loom, it's a pretty, pretty big one. Now Job is also a traveling weaver. So this is basically just a big wooden erector set. So you can take out all these uh, pins and whatnot and the loom can actually come, come apart and Job would actually take this on his wagon and go to like on assignment to uh, other people's houses or their, their farms or, or whatnot and weave for them. Uh, and this was great for Job because they would be supplying him uh, the materials, the wool or the, or the, uh, the, the yarn and the, the flax, the linen. Uh, and then when he was done, after he weaved for them, he would get a uh, percentage of the, with the material he eventually wove, wove and then also the uh, a, a percentage of the uh, raw materials. So this was definitely good, good for him. 
And also, with uh, him being gone, I'm pretty sure his wife <laughs> enjoyed that a little bit too. Uh, so how does this work? You can see that on the, f on the floor here, there are some pedals. Now, so he would be sitting back here, and you put one pit set of pedals uh, down, and then once one of these comes up, which brings up half of the, uh, the, the, um, the yard here. Then you would pass your shuttle, this is called a shuttle in the 18th century, it holds all, all your yarn. You pass that through, through all, all of them, then you push it back down and then you put up the second pedal, which brings up the other one, and then you pass it back the, up, the other way. So that way you get like a crisscross uh, forming. So you get a nice little checker design there. This, this is using some white, some off-white, and some uh, navy blue um, uh, wool thread. So this would probably be used to make a, uh, a bed cover, like we saw in the, the bed chamber. And that's pretty much what Job is, is making. He's making uh, bed coverings, bed sheets, uh, rough cloth that can be used for sacks and uh, like burlap and stuff like that. Um, and also probably a, a, a cloth for uh, slave clothing. He is not making like fine, fine wool like that I'm wearing or fine linen like my, uh, my uh, small clothes are made out of because at this point uh, in 1775, uh, everything in, well, pre-1774 at this point, I'll get to that in a second, uh, is highly regulated by the British government because uh, the British government does not want uh, manufacturers like uh, the uh, textile industries in the colonies to make fine fabric. They want the colonies to buy fine fabric from English manufacturers, English clothing makers. So, so Job as a weaver here in the colonies is pretty much banned from making fine linen and, and, fi and fine wool for, for clothing. This changes a little bit though in 1774 because at the end of this big, uh, the first Continental Congress, uh, the delegates there draft up what's, what's called the General Association. And the General Association was basically, was basically a protest against, uh, against uh, England, against uh, Great Britain, basically saying we are no longer going to import and buy British goods. And this was great for, for businessmen here in the colonies. They were like, oh great, so like weavers, oh now I can make fine linen and, and, and fine wool and, and sell that. Like we're, we're open for, for business. Um, did Job do that? Don't really know, because uh, the General Association, there was no legal precedent for it. Uh, this was not British law. This was basically the, the, lo the local uh, committees of safety uh, kind of enforcing um, kind of like pseudo law. Uh, so what, what would happen if you like broke the association? Because there were also limits. There were limits to what you, you could, uh, could do in your personal life. Like for example, you couldn't have horse racing or card games. You couldn't gamble. You couldn't have huge balls. You couldn't go to the local tavern and have, have a party and, and, and stuff like that. The Puritans in New England love this. But uh, here in, in New York, it's, does that seem like liberty to you? It doesn't really sound like to me. But the idea was that these were, these were trying times. Like we're, we're butting heads with, with Parliament. Like we should not be having fun. We shouldn't be gambling and having, having parties in this time of, time of crisis. So what would happen if you broke the association? So if you broke the association, someone caught you having a card game in your home um, or, or something like that, uh, you were then the community safety would come down, usually with militia, and then brought, bring you to the meeting house and they would have uh, some type of trial. Again, this is not legal at, at all. And then they would have a hearing. It was actually it would more be a, more of a hearing, not a trial. Um, and then it was basically a, like he said, he said, you said, this, uh, he said, type of thing. Crazy, absolutely crazy. And so if they found you guilt, guilty, uh, then sometimes there would be like this is the easy way to get out. Uh, we find you guilty, will you pay a fine? Okay, fine, you pay the fine. That's fine. But sometimes they would say, well, we declare you an enemy of American liberty and we shall post it in the local gazetteer. And that was Riverstein's gazetteer from, uh, from New York City. And so that would publicize everywhere that this person is an enemy of American liberty. 
that basically destroys your personal and uh, and professional reputation. So you basically, you just have to get up and get out of here, so where no one knows knows your name. Uh, it's a very very hard time living under the thumb of the, of the association. This all changes though uh, after July 1776, which you all should all know what happened. Uh, what happens then? But again, that is a uh, story for a different day. Uh, that hopefully you could uh, learn about at our uh, Huntington Independence Day, which is this coming July. Hopefully we are not still at stay-at-home orders uh, then, uh, but if we are, then we'll have another live stream uh, back in, in July uh, regarding that. We do have some questions, I believe, so we're going to uh, an answer some. One. All right, this is from, uh, from Jason, but it looks like Anne-Marie uh, answered it. How old do you have to do join the militia? So uh, the militias were a civic obligation. Uh, so every uh, man that was able-bodied had to, do, to serve between the ages of 16 and 60. Uh, so from 16 years old to 60. So that's pretty much the entire uh, male population. As long as you uh, don't have a specific job, like sometimes doctors were, were exempt because they needed them to uh, for, uh, for those. Uh, uh, for those jobs, or for or clergy, obviously. Uh, so, but 16 years old, you're you're in the militia. All right. So that's pretty much that's pretty much the tour of of, of the arsenal uh, of the home of Job Samus. So I hope that you guys can come out uh, here to Huntington uh, when everything starts opening back up. Uh, we do have events planned for the rest of the, the year. Um, and we really hope that you can come out and learn about Long Island history, Huntington history, uh, early Revolutionary War uh, history. And uh, if you're interested in, in joining us, because we are a volunteer organization, uh, as the Huntington Militia, we've been established since the year 1653, but in 1970s we were reestablished as a, uh, as a, a living history organization. Uh, so we're a bunch of reenactors uh, that put on funny clothes, uh, every now and again to, to, to portray living history here on Long Island. Uh, so if you're interested in joining, come on, check out our website, HuntingtonMilitia.com. Check out our Facebook, which you're already on, obviously. Um, and, and look at our photos and videos. Um, talk to our members. Uh, if you want to email me, our email is HuntingtonMilitia at gmail.com. Uh, we're always looking for uh, new members. We are a family-friendly friend, uh, 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 group. Uh, women, children, uh, um, and any all ages are, are, are welcome to, to join. So if you have any information, if you have any um, questions or comments, please keep on uh, putting them into the comments section. And uh, we really hope to see you uh, sometime in the future. So good day.